Good morning. I'm the Reverend Stephen Protzman, your minister, coming to you live from our church sanctuary. Thank you for joining us this morning as we gather virtually once again. A spiritual community that seeks to be diverse and inclusive as we inspire love, work for justice, and grow together in community. Whoever you are, wherever you've come from, whomever you love, we welcome you. May our time together be filled with joy, with belonging, with hope, and with the promise of who we can be together. We extend a special welcome to our visitors. Thank you for joining us this morning. Visitors, if you'd like to know more about our church and be known to us, please contact our administrator to be added to our e-news list or to be welcomed by our welcome team. I wanna say thank you to our team leading worship remotely, including those who won't be on camera. We have the Reverend Christy Anderson, Andrew Rome, our Director of Religious Education, Colleen Taylor, our Music Director, Hal Walker, Renee Rehutsky, our Visual Technician, Kevin Breeden, our Technical Host, and Joe Kemmerly, our Virtual Host. Thank you. We are a people who care for one another and value the connections we have with each other and with this community. Let's spend a few minutes now in our breakout rooms so we can say hello to one another and check in. Welcome back, everyone. Our candle of memory this morning is for Mary Thompson, who died on Wednesday. We send our sympathy and care to Rod Thompson and to Rod and Mary's family. A memorial service will be held sometime later. Again, welcome. In 1969, something happened that would be unimaginable today. A river caught on fire. The Cuyahoga River, which flows through Kent, was so polluted with trash and chemicals that it caught on fire near Cleveland and in turn set an overhead bridge on fire. Not only were our rivers and lakes extremely polluted, so was the air. As a child, I grew up about six blocks away from the industrial section of my small town. I remember walking to and from school and arriving with specks of soot on my face from the dirty smoke spewing from the factories. The foul odors emanating from the factories were considered the smell of prosperity. In the late 1960s, Americans became concerned about the negative impact of humans on the environment. A U.S. Senator from Wisconsin, Gaylord Nelson, envisioned a national movement to raise awareness of the need to save our water, air, soil, and animals. He was joined by a Republican Senator, Pete McCloskey, and together, they raised enough money to hire a staff of 85 young adults who were to raise public awareness. They began with the creation of a national teach-in day called Earth Day, which took place on April 22, 1970. The event was a success as 20 million Americans, over 10% of the population, participated in public events. According to the Earth Ministry of the Unitarian Universalist website, groups that had been fighting individually against oil spills, polluting factories, power plants, toxic dumps, pesticides, the loss of wilderness, and the extinction of wildlife, united on Earth Day. The event achieved a rare political alignment, enlisting support from Republicans and Democrats, rich and poor, urban dwellers and farmers, businesses, and labor leaders. By the end of 1970, the first Earth Day led to the creation of the United States Environmental Protection Agency and the passage of the Clean Air, Clean Water, and Endangered Species Acts. A lot has been accomplished 
since that initial Earth Day. But as we know, there is much more that is critically needed in order to save our planet from drastic changes impacting wildlife and humans. The good news is that the youth and young adults of today are energetically continuing the legacy of environmental activism. This is spiritual work grounded on the Unitarian Universalist seventh principle. For those of you listening alongside your children, ask them, what is the UU seventh principle? Our children learn that we believe in caring for our planet Earth, the home we share with all living things, which adults refer to as honoring the interconnected web of all existence. Come, let us join together as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day and call to mind the awesome wonder of the natural world. Our covenant response song is Bloomin' Ohio. It's a song that uh, is a call and response. So I sing and then you sing. I'd like to invite everyone to sing after me, especially the young people out there. I've got a I've got a recipe for spring. I've got a recipe for spring. And it's making me want to sing. And it's making me want to sing. Because everywhere that I go, everywhere that I go, it's blooming Ohio. I've got a recipe for hope. I've got a recipe for hope. Living in a poem that I wrote. With a worm and a bird and a song. Here in Bloomin' Ohio, it takes a tablespoon of sun, two cups of blue sky, stir in the green growing grass, and a day full of butterflies. Preheat the season with compost, worms, and mud, and then breathe in the sweetness. Blossoms, blooms, and buds, blossoms, blooms, and buds. I've got a recipe for spring, and it's making me want to sing. It's making me want to sing, because everywhere that I go is blooming Ohio. Hey, kiddos. So right now, all the playgrounds are closed. All the fancy ones like Cafe O Play and the McDonald's Playland and Chuck E. Cheese and all of those places. Even outdoor places and jungle gyms are off limits. And I was thinking about that this week and I started thinking about my own childhood and my need to explore and play. I grew up in Kent and in my parents' backyard and they still live there now, there are woods. And if you walk into the woods, and go straight up a hill, you'll reach the top of the hill and at the top is a bike trail. My brothers and I would carefully lug our bikes all the way up to the top of that hill and onto that path almost every day. Biking on gravel has its challenges. Good thing it's paved now. We had many skinned knees up there. My mom would set limits on our adventures depending on how old we were. See, there were three bridges on our stretch of the trail. Each bridge had about a quarter of a mile between them. She would let us know how far we could go by telling us which bridge we could get to before we had to turn around and head back toward home. She often packed a brown bag of snacks and some water for us knowing that we would be journeying, meandering, stopping and starting along the trail and that we would probably need refreshments. Because friends, this was no ordinary trail. Each bridge had magical experiences along the way to it. On the way to the first bridge, there were wild raspberry bushes, daffodil hills, and a hill so steep that we called it Dead Man's Hill, but we would fly down it anyway on our bikes. Sometimes we would fall, but sometimes we did not, and those times were exhilarating. Once at the bottom of the hill, we had arrived at the first bridge, so we'd park our bikes, 
travel off the path, go into the woods around the bridge, go under the bridge, and review what was in the creek. We discovered so many things, so many birds and critters, and we'd get very, very muddy in the process. On the way to the second bridge, this was my favorite part. There was a frog pond. Every day when I was up there, I would sit in front of the frog pond and just watch as the tadpoles slowly transformed each day, their tails getting shorter and shorter until they turned into frogs. Then, just beyond the frog pond and right around the bend toward the second bridge was a grassy hill. The grass was so tall that our dog Misty would fly through the air and disappear into the hill. Moments later, we'd see her fly up over the grass again, and we would laugh and laugh. She was at her happiest during those days. It took me a long time to feel comfortable enough to travel to that third bridge, but I'll never forget the day that I did. When my best friend and my dog made the full trek, there beside the bridge was a fort tucked off to the side into the woods. It had down trees for benches and a roof made of brush. We never discovered who actually built the fort, but whoever it was created a fortress for us that we spent hours in over the years. In that fort, we rested before the long journey back home. In that fort, we dreamed dreams of growing up and planned our lives and sang songs. We told jokes and we made up stories. Once we were rested, we started our journey back, but we were always sure to repair the fort and keep it the way that we found it. Returning home covered in mud, sometimes with a scraped knee or elbow and exhausted from exploring, my mom would ask us, what did you discover? There was always something new to tell her. Interesting bugs we had never seen before, garter snakes, pockets full of interesting rocks and flowers. These memories that I spent in the woods and on either side of that trail and under those bridges and quietly watching the tadpoles transform are some of the happiest memories of my childhood. I can still smell the air and the mud and the flowers and I can still taste those wild raspberries. I can feel the dirt underneath my fingernails and my soggy shoes. I could feel the connection that I made with my brothers and with my mom. I could still hear my mom's laugh when she spied us coming out of the woods for the first time. It looked like we'd been in the wild for months, though we'd only been gone a couple of hours. When I recall these things, I'm reminded that I did not need a fancy playground. I did not need equipment to climb on. I did not need a Chuck E. Cheese. I needed my bike in the woods muddy tennis shoes, and tadpoles. The earth was my playground. So looking back on these memories, I learned a lot about myself and I learned a lot about life in those woods. I learned that when I fall, I can also get back up. I learned that it's okay to be cautious, but it's also okay to take risks. I learned that sometimes I'm not ready, but if I give myself a moment to think about it and to relax, I can be brave. I learned that sometimes it's absolutely great to walk off the path because a new adventure could await that you didn't know was there. And I learned that it's good to stop and rest and rejuvenate before starting the rest of your journey. So today, I'd like to invite you to ponder, what has the Earth's playground taught you? Thank you, Carl. Wonderful story. In the spirit of pausing and resting on our journey, deepening our connections and offering each other support and compassion as our life journeys across bridges and through fields, life as individuals and the community continues. It's time to take some time to share our joys and concerns, our struggles and achievements, our playgrounds in life with one another. I would invite you now, if you have a joy or concern to share congregation and with me, to use the chat box. We send wishes to Val for her 50th birthday coming up. We remember Brian, we honor Mary Thompson's 
memory and her participation in congregational life. Yay, a new dog, Chris. And we give thanks for the prevailing wisdom of our governor. We send a birthday wishes to Bonnie, celebrating a birthday yesterday. Let's hold Scott in our thoughts. Cat's mom turned 82 yesterday, congrats. We offer concerns for the Navajo Nation. We hold Andrew in our thoughts as he recovers and his family. We pray for a friend's elderly mother who's dealing with dementia, isolation. Pray for John and others who are struggling with despair and possibly coronavirus or other illnesses. Julie, congratulations, 66. We hold Becky's brother in our hearts and thoughts, send wishes for healing. Yay, the forsythia and daffodils. Old Bethany's mom, Janet, in our thoughts and our hearts. We offer our care and concern for prisoners, especially Marion Correctional Center. Many people there have been diagnosed. Katie, congratulations on your 25th anniversary. Glad you still like each other. Benny, thank you. I'm glad you liked that story and thank you for not doing any littering or polluting. Let's hold minorities in our hearts and thoughts with less insurance, higher risk of the virus. And they do live in polluted areas. Let's commit ourselves to working to make life better for them. We remember those in our Kent Hogwarts family who are sick, holding Mel in our thoughts and our hearts. Thank you from the Caresses. We miss you too. Gratitude for the earth, for the grass. We remember all students who will be struggling to complete this semester. We send them courage and strength needed to finish their classwork. We honor all teachers who have adjusted and adapted to this time and are helping our students learn. Brad's joy of talking with Mary and Ike and Joe yesterday at a marathon in Kent. I hope your class goes well, Vivian, your intensive online course. It starts Thursday. Yes, thank you, Joe, for your video on pretzel making. We all feel joy for everyone being together and reaching out to one another. Thank you. We send love for, to Dee for the loss of her dog, Emma, last week. We send our sympathy and care to Katie, who lost her cat last week. And we hold in our hearts and thoughts everyone grieving because they've lost a family member or friend of the coronavirus. May they find peace and comfort. Thank you everyone for sharing these joyous concerns. Let's take some silent time now to honor what we've shared, to honor what we have in our hearts and minds right now, our loved ones, our friends. Some of you may feel as though we are entombed in the darkness of uncertainty, the ground of our being shifting unpredictably beneath us. During this challenging time, 
Let us bear in mind the words of May Sarton, who reminds us, help us to be the always hopeful gardeners of the spirit, who know that without darkness, nothing comes to birth. I invite you to join me in prayer by saying aloud these words adapted from Eugene Pickett. I give thanks this day for the expanding grandeur of creation, worlds known and unknown, galaxies beyond galaxies, filling us with awe and challenging our imaginations. I give thanks this day for this fragile planet Earth, its time and tides, its sunsets and seasons. I give thanks this day for the joy of human life, its wonders and surprises, its hopes and achievements. I give thanks this day for human community, which has repeatedly revealed that from out of the depth of tragedy, human spirits arise and embody a power creating a better world. I give thanks this day I pray that I may live not by fears, but by hope, not by words, but by deeds. May it be so. Amen.
I lived in Portland, Oregon for 11 years. During those years, I spent a lot of time exploring the Columbia River Gorge just east of Portland. The gorge was created during the last ice age 14,000 to 20,000 years ago as a series of floods carved the gorge out of the volcanic rock, creating a magical place where trees, rocks, mountain slopes, and waterfalls offer incredible natural beauty. Along with hiking and exploring, swimming in the cold water from Mount Hood's glaciers on hot summer days, I sought solace and so solitude in the gorge many times as I experienced life's challenges. This part of the earth was a teacher for me in many ways. Along with witnessing the changing seasons and the gorgeous beauty, I also came to understand more deeply change and loss because even this sacred place is no more exempt from these forces than we are. One year a fire started during the dry days of summer. Have you ever seen a forest fire burning Flames leaping from tree to tree, the wind, the heat, the roar of the fire as it destroys everything in its path. It's terrifying. Many acres of the gorge burn, leaving an enormous black scar on the land. But as I witnessed the following spring, destruction and the loss of life are catalysts for new growth. In burning out all the debris of dead trees and thick undergrowth, the fire provided the heat and the room needed by wildflower seeds in the ground to germinate. That spring, the landscape was ablaze in a totally different way as wildflowers grew and exploded in a spring frenzy of color. Life, in its tenacity, not only survived seeming total destruction, it thrived and renewed itself with a beauty that I will never forget. I have carried that story of the Gorge Fire with me to remind me not only of life's fragility, but also of life's resilience and its power to renew itself and to recover after disaster. As we struggle with the coronavirus, may the earth be a powerful teacher of our own resilience and power to renew and recreate ourselves. My wife, Amanda, and I have been trying to live in right relationship with the Earth. After getting married, we volunteered for AmeriCorps, moved to Washington State, and worked at the CISPIS Environmental Education Camp in the middle of Cowlitz National Forest. Living and working, living and working with people in such a beautiful and isolated place was inspiring. Our experiences in Washington helped guide our choices about the direction we wanted our lives to take. There was a great flood while we were there. Three days of heavy rain and snowmelt created a national disaster area flood and washed out the one road connecting our town to the rest of the world. Amanda and I had been going door to door to help evacuate an area in case the dam broke. And then we were stranded away from our home. We slept in the Presbyterian church, helped make community meals, and that's when I learned to love natural disasters. I certainly don't mean the suffering disasters create and the terrible loss so many families endure. But during times of crisis, I saw our small community become more connected than ever before. Maybe the connections were already there, and when really put to the test, our truest, best nature came forward, and I could see it. I still remember that lesson today. But that wasn't the dream I came away with. Amanda and I later bought a house in Stowe, figuring we'd be here for a few years before moving someplace more rural. We got busy and became Unitarian Universalists and started foster parenting and adopted some lovely children and then we decided it's time. We wanted to homestead for real. I mean, living in a self-sufficient cabin, we build ourselves, the American dream of 40 acres and a mule. We'd live off the land and be surrounded by direct experiences of transcendent mystery and wonder. And the spirit of Ralph Waldo Emerson's enlightenment would seep into our collective unconscious. To prepare, 
we watched Netflix reality shows like Live Free or Die about the rewilding lifestyle. We increased our gardening, raised chickens and bees, tapped our trees for maple, foraged for food in local parks. We watched our suburban yard come alive. We saw insects return, like realizing that the black specks that collect in depressions of melting snow are actually springtails, a tiny insect which shows up in healthy soil. We now find red and black salamanders in our herb spiral and watch the mason bees, dragonflies, and hummingbirds visit our miniature prairie and native plant rain gardens. Our dog is the top predator, patrolling for shrews, chipmunks, and rabbits in the unmowed grassy area. Our permaculture plantings take off and we see a backyard ecosystem take shape. I think we're ready. I look at landwatch.com to scope out properties. The closest, cheapest, wildest place is the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and I decide to go there. I'm going to upgrade my camping skills and try backpacking. So I talk to experts like Mary and Randy Leeson and plan a trip. I'm going to hike for three days at Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore with the intention of scouting out the area for moving there. After a full day's drive to get there, I pull on my 40 pound pack and get started. Actually, it's brutal. I'm right on the coast of Lake Michigan and a storm has brought 50 mile per hour winds across the water, picking up sand from the beach and blasting my face. I can barely see the trail to my site and have miles to go before stopping. Over the wind and rain, I hear trees crashing down in the forest around me. This does not seem safe, but I'm fine. And the next days are beautiful. I have three days to myself in nature. It's great. I mean, I like the woods and seeing plants and things. Sunshine through the leaves and bird noises. I like the quiet and wrote some. I had time to be without as much doing. But overwhelmingly, I found my reaction was different than I expected. I wanted to tell everyone about what I saw. I wanted to tell my spouse about each flowering moss and weird tree shape. I wanted to tell the Leesons about how their gear recommendations worked out. I wanted to talk to my father, my old friends. I thought about our church Walden campouts. And basically, I missed my people. When I returned home, Amanda and I talked about it. We loved living in the mountains of Washington and becoming part of the community there. We love our community now, and moving to some dream of unspoiled nature would mean leaving that community. It was great to visit a beautiful place, but the real joy we found is not in a solitary experience of nature, but rather in the communal experience of whatever Mother Nature brings, from floods to garden feasts. We decided we don't need to go anywhere to feel connected to the earth, but we can find that connection in our spring flowers and in Facebook stories about crazy Ohio weather. We've got nature right here. And I'm so happy to share it with you. When I moved into my house on South Chestnut Street in 1996, the whole backyard was paved. At my house, there's a narrow driveway along one side of the house that leads to the garage in the back of the property. The previous owner, Mr. Green, had paved pretty much the whole yard to provide a turnaround for his car. Now I'm sensitive to sun and I much prefer shade. So the heat produced by this vast expanse of concrete made me very uncomfortable. Within the first couple years of living there, I rented a jackhammer and started chopping away at the concrete. I soon discovered that this was not just any old concrete. This was eight inches of steel reinforced concrete that made my Home Depot rental seem very small. 
I spent the next 10 years finding helpers to remove one section of concrete at a time. The last section of concrete to be removed is where my vegetable garden currently resides. I'm proud to say that the driveway is no longer wide enough for a car to get all the way to the garage. Ever since I started my vegetable garden, there's been a big Norwegian pine tree blocking the morning sunlight. For about 10 years, I resisted the temptation to cut down that tree. Even when I trimmed the branches all the way up the tree, that funny looking Christmas tree on top cast a shadow on my garden for most of the morning. Who am I to cut down a glorious Norwegian pine? I mean, that tree's been around a lot longer than I have. And anyway, half my family's Norwegian. <laughs> but last year, I made the difficult decision. I cut the tree down. The story I'd like to tell you is about the domino effect of good things that happened after that tree came down. The removal of the tree had an almost immediate impact on the garden. Suddenly, my early, my early summer lettuce plants and baby chard plants seemed so happy drinking up the newfound morning sunlight. Suddenly, there was a wide open sky that brought a real freshness to the back corner of my yard. I realized that I had this new fresh space for a sitting area. So I dragged out my neglected, weather-worn, wrought iron garden bench from the garage and I found my old electric sander in the basement. Now, I'm not someone who knows how to refinish a bench, but I did it anyway. I took it apart piece by piece. I even replaced one of the slats with a new piece of wood. My newfound abilities with the sander inspired me to drag out the old neglected ping pong table from the back of the garage and sand the surface so it would be playable once again. Kim and I started playing ping pong every night, and when we were done, we would rest on the newly refinished bench with an unobstructed view of the sky and the moon. Our experience playing ping pong led us to the Samson Dubina Table Tennis Academy, where we both have taken lessons, and my lifelong interest in ping pong has been nourished and encouraged. Right about the same time as taking that tree down, some church members and I took a look at the lot behind the church and noticed how overgrown it had become. For several Sundays in a row, we dove in there and cleared out many truckloads of brush. With my newfound interest in refinishing benches, I saw those old neglected weather-worn benches at the church and I thought to myself, after all these years that I've complained about those benches being neglected, it had never once occurred to me that I could actually do something about it. So piece by piece, I took those benches apart and started transporting them home on my scooter to my garage. Wooden slat by wooden slat, right next to the flourishing garden, I began the process of making those benches new again and then installing them back in place late at night so no one would know who had done it. I'm confident that all this happened because of the sacrifice of that Norwegian pine. I have to be honest, on this 50th celebration Earth Day, as I think about all the uncertainty of the year ahead, the thought of taking down that old crooked oak tree behind the church to expand our campus makes me uncomfortable. But I offer my story as a challenge. Maybe this is a case similar to my story of the Norwegian pine. Maybe that tree needs to come down to let the sunlight in so that we can build a sacred space for the people to gather. When the tree comes down, I know for sure that we're the ones that will have to do the work of sanding the metaphorical ping pong table and refinishing the metaphorical benches. We're the ones that will have to continue the challenging work of building community in a broken world. The sunlight can only do so much. We're the ones that will have to tend the garden. Many years ago, my husband Brad and I decided to spend a sunny afternoon traveling to Wayne County to hike in Johnson Woods State Preserve. It's one of the few virgin forests remaining in Ohio with trees as old as 400 years. Oaks and hickories are 120 feet tall 
and some trunks are four to five feet in diameter, which is unusual in Ohio. As we drove closer to the preserve, the weather changed abruptly with dark storm clouds thundering in. Brad absolutely loves watching clouds, especially dark, fast moving, threatening storm clouds. While I head to the basement, he heads for the car with camera in hand. He truly comes alive with the fury of nature. As we drove on, the tornado's sirens blared, while severe hail, then rainfall, surged from the swirling cloud mass. To my relief, Brad pulled into a driveway, but then he quickly pulled out and headed in a different direction. In his excitement, he exclaimed, I'm going to look for the epicenter. My heart sank and panic set in. Fortunately, from my perspective, the rain was so strong and it had become so dark that there was no visibility and Brad had to pull off the road. As we sat in the car in the dark, listening to pounding rain, sirens, and howling wind, I could feel the car rock as the wind hammered it relentlessly. And then as quickly as the storm marched in, it was gone. The rain stopped, the dark clouds departed, and the sun cast its cheery rays. As I unclenched my fingers from my seatbelt, which had been my lifeline, my heart was racing. Brad, unfazed, headed for Johnson Woods. Once there, I stepped out of the car, glad to have my feet on solid ground. We had only walked into the forest a short distance before I stopped in my tracks. My sense of vision and hearing having been heightened from my adrenaline surge during the storm, were totally attuned to my surroundings. The green of the plants and dark hues of tree bark were vivid, their color magnified by their wet surfaces. The trees were shedding drops of water and lush vegetation was bathed in water droplets. The sunbeams, kissing the droplets created a kaleidoscope of tiny sparkling lights. I was in a crystal palace with a bright emerald canopy. I was embraced on all sides, overhead and under my feet in beauty. I could feel viscerally. I was so transformed I couldn't move. The image of that glorious scene is forever etched in my mind. Within a 30 minute period, I had experienced the raw destructive power and the serene majesty of nature. Both were humbling experiences. We learned the next day that a tornado had indeed caused quite a bit of damage, not too far from where we were. I don't regret at all that experience I had that day. But Brad and I did talk after that, and he understands and respects my boundaries for taking risks. Through compromise, we have found ways to interact with the natural world that are lower risk. Yet due to his encouragement, my experiences have continued to expand by exploring at times of day and in weather conditions when I would not normally have ventured out. We've taken flashlights outside at night, despite swarms of menacing mosquitoes, to look for insects in the grass, unseen during the daylight. On a hot summer day, we were captivated by dozens of screeching cicadas crawling all over us. In the dead of winter, We've examined animal tracks and were confounded by our first encounter with snow fleas. I've realized that even in my seemingly mundane yard, wonders of the natural world abound 
if I seek them out with intention. As all of us are spending time closely tethered to our homes right now, I hope that you'll take time to make a concerted effort to connect with the natural world that we so often overlook in the busyness of our lives. Even when walking that same route around our neighborhoods day after day, if we train our eyes to see with deliberation, we can connect with the comforting heartbeat of the earth. The sight of migrating birds and spring buds unfolding reminds us of the repeated refrains of nature, the assurance that spring arrives after, dawn, after winter, dawn after night, and life after isolation. I close with these words of inspiration by Lynn Harrison. Committed to respond to the call of a wounded world, we join together this day with loving hearts, hands, and minds, embracing the interconnected web of water, air, and earth. As we give thanks for this earth, our shared and singular home, may we dedicate ourselves to its ongoing care rising to the calls deep within us and all around us, may we respond today and always with courage and with love. Participation in the abundant life of this church provides opportunities for adults and children to articulate and practice living our values. One of our strong common values is environmental conservation. Appreciation for the natural world is reinforced in our children through the Children's RE program, multi-generational Where's Walden trips, and our beloved Hogwarts program. These programs and all of this church's important work is supported through our donations. During the past month, while we've worshiped through virtual means rather than in our physical space, the collection plate contributions have fallen. We recognize that these are financially difficult times for some members. So as you are able, we hope that you will give to support the continuing work of this church community. While Hal provides music, enjoy watching photos taken over many years that portray our UUCK children and youth engaging with the natural world.
It's time now to bring our service to its close. Would you join me in the words for extinguishing the chalice as we extinguish our chalices at home and our chalice here? We extinguish this flame, not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. We carry these in our hearts and in our minds until we are together again. These are the words of Donna Markova. The seeds of life that are in all of us want to expand outward. The shell around each seed that grows thick to protect it must crack if the seed is to sprout. What is known and familiar must fall away. When the shell gets too thick, you listen really deeply in the silence. You will hear your soul keening. Sacred hungers keep pushing at our edges, wanting us to let go of the old way. We have kept ourselves secure so we can expand into blossoming the life force of what we love. And now renewed by our time together, holding before us a vision of the beauty and wonder of the earth and knowing we are called to care for this beautiful, fragile planet, let us go forth in joy and in hope to continue inspiring love, seeking justice, and growing community. May it be so, blessed be, and amen. Now, would you join in singing our song of blessing and sending, You've Got the Light of Love? You've got the light of love inside you. Go on your way in peace. So shine that light. This whole world now awaits you. Go on your way in peace. You've got the light of love inside you. Go on your way in peace. So shine that light. This whole world now awaits you. Go on your way in peace. You know we hold you. We hold.